Yeah, so today the talk will be given by Yuval. So Yuval is our very own postdoc, and he'll be talking about why quantum algorithm papers are so long. Okay, uh, take yes. it away. You, you pronounced that correctly, Troy. So ah, okay, that. yes, yes. Yeah, so yeah, I think, I think uh, most people know me. So if you don't, my name is Yuval. Uh, I do quantum algorithms research, and um, I'm taking this kind of whimsical uh, title of the talk to uh, give a sense of what it is that I do and uh, why, uh, why, why, what's, what are the challenges there and try to highlight a particular methodological challenge. So um, I'm intending to speak for approximately 45 minutes to allow for like plenty of questions because I'm anticipating questions. Um, and, uh, uh, but, for, for, but just to sort of kick it off, uh, I just want to point out that I'm mostly talking about papers that uh, I've I've co-authored. So these are the two that I chose. So there's um, the one on the left is from uh, 20. Well, it was on the archive in 2020. I think it was published earlier this year. Uh, and uh, this is about combinatorial optimization, which we'll talk a bit more about. Um, and the other one has just appeared on the archive in the last uh, few weeks. And uh, this is uh, work that we've been doing for quite some time. So notice that these are both about quantum algorithms. Uh, and then on the left, we're talking about combinatorial optimization, and on the right, we're talking about uh, quantum field theory in some sense. So um, that's that's just sort of the setting for this. I'm I'm in some sense I'm in some sense using this as a lever to introduce my work to people who don't already know it, uh, but I'm also trying to use it as a lever to explain what it is that I'm trying to do now and what sort of I have in mind for the next few years of my research uh, and uh, just general activities because I think that there's um, well, as, as if you've read the abstract, you know that I think that there's some kind of a methodological problem here. So I'm doing my best to explain what that is. So just to give a sense of what we're talking about. So uh, that first paper I talked about is about combinatorial optimization. And because uh, I'm an Australian and Canadian, and because we're in Australia, I'm using the correct spelling. So that's why I've highlighted that. Um, so the, the sort of one slide summary of what that paper is about is just to say that we compile several heuristic approaches to combinatorial optimization on a quantum computer. And we were focused on, pro on approaches that are of recent interest. So we weren't trying to be exhaustive. We were really sort of trying to focus on those which are seen as interesting nowadays for using a quantum computer to do uh, heuristic optimization methods. Uh, and I do mean heuristic, which I'll explain in a moment. Um, so the approaches that we looked at, so we had various different heuristic approaches uh, for four different problem domains. So um, this is essentially, um, you imagine some like bucket of optimization problems that you're allowed to draw from, but you know something about the bucket. So, uh, so from left to right, this is sort of more general to more specific. So uh, the L-term spin model is sort of a very generic kind of a, uh, an optimization problem. And then uh, quadratic unconstrained binary optimization, Cubo is um, the sort of thing that uh, D-Wave believes they can do better. And then the rest of us sort of are not sure if we agree. Uh, Sherrington Kirkpatrick is kind of a spin glass model, and Labs is a particular instance of uh, L term spin where uh, it, basically for each uh, size, uh, so for each number of bits to be optimized, uh, there is exactly one instance. Uh, and it's essentially, it's Labs stands for low, low autocorrelation binary sequences. Uh, if you don't know what these are, it's not so important for this talk. This is just to say that we looked at some. Uh, problem domains that are sort of of particular interest in, in recent quantum algorithms literature. And uh, it's, it's sort of, you know, if, you, if you're interested, you're interested. If you're not, just believe that people find those interesting. And so we performed a computational cost analysis on uh, the results of these computations, uh, compilations rather. So we took these heuristic approaches, we figured out what the quantum computer would be doing at a low level, meaning like what circuits they would execute, the quantum computer would execute. Uh, and we figured out sort of roughly how big those circuits are, and then we sort of translated that into some uh, numerical assessment of how long um, uh, a Google fault-tolerant quantum computer would run, because this was in collaboration with Google, so they, they wanted it on their machine, so we, we obliged because I don't really care. Um, so the real point that I want to raise in the context of this talk, so I've talked about this work before. It's been out for like a year, and uh, I actually talked about it at QIP, so there's a bit more to it than that um, that you can see there. But the thing that I want to highlight in this talk is that um, this is a sort of analysis that you'd expect to be doing a lot of, uh, but this kind of analysis, uh, it basically it took us like something like two years of work and we're a pretty expert team at this point. Uh, and the result is 77 pages long. And this is very much par for the course when it comes to doing quantum algorithms research at this point. To give a sense of the results, 
Um, after we do this like two years and 77 pages worth of work, we can come up with a sort of headline table, kind of like what we're what I'm showing over here. So uh, just from left to right, I'm distinguishing between two different kinds of problems domains. So this is Sherrington, Kirkpatrick, and Labs. Uh, the algorithm primitive is given various heuristic approaches. There are specific bottleneck uh, subroutines that kind of dominate the runtime complexity. Uh, and uh, then we make some judgment about how many steps of this algorithm primitive per day we could do on a uh, million qubit. Well, let's, uh, I mean, it doesn't matter that it's a million qubit quantum computer, just say it's that this is the number of steps per day on an uh, error prone quantum computer that is being corrected with the surface code. Uh, and so then you'll notice that all the physical qubits are less than 10 to the six, which is not an accident. And uh, then the Toffoli counts is essentially what we're counting. So the idea is that the numbers that you see in the middle columns are derived from the numbers, well, not the numbers, but the expressions that you see in the rightmost column. Uh, and just to clarify, in the rightmost column, I'm treating all, uh, uh, I'm treating all um, bits of precision as being a, some sort of fixed constant. So there's no uh, indication of the scaling in terms of bits of precision, uh, working precision throughout the algorithm. And so you'll notice, for example, that there's no error tolerance mentioned in the right-hand column. And this is, uh, let's call it a limitation of the study. Um, so this one sort of a bunch of people noticed because we in our in our abstract we said that um, uh, that our analysis suggests that quantum accelerated simulated annealing would require roughly a day and a million physical qubits to optimize spin glasses that can be solved by classical simulated annealing in about four CPU minutes. So when we talk about spin glasses, we're talking about SK sharing to Kirkpatrick. Uh, when we're talking about uh, beating, well, comparing to classical simulated annealing, there's a, there's basically QSA refers to simulated annealing. Uh, quantum, the Q is for quantum, so it's quantum simulated annealing, meaning that it is a quantum computer doing the simulation, uh, but the annealing is classical. So this is distinct from quantum annealing. Uh, and then there's a couple of different approaches we looked at to that. So um, that's there's a lot to say about that, um, but uh, I just want to sort of give a sense that uh, that 77 pages produced a table something like this, and this is the overall message is something that I can deliver to you, and then the 77 pages is in some sense to derive the sorts of numbers that we're seeing here, and most of that work is actually about the Toffoli count on the far right. So um, now that you have a sense of what that paper is about, I want to switch and talk about the more recent paper, uh, and I'm basically just going to do it at a very overview sort of level. So um, the idea was that in um, some, some time ago, there was a paper by Jordan Lee and Preskill about simulating quantum field theory on a quantum computer. And um, there were, and so there, there's this whole simulated algorithm that I've, a whole, whole quantum simulation algorithm that I'm not going to go into. Um, but basically, it starts by preparing a ground state. And so if you look at how uh, Jordan Lee Preskill chose to prepare that ground state, the idea is that that ground state is supposed to be some kind of a Gaussian state. And they used a generic Gaussian state preparation routine uh, suggested by Alexei Kitaev and um, uh, what I believe was a student of his at the time, Webb. I forgot his first name. Um, and uh, the point was that uh, in some circumstances, at least, the classical costs of executing Kitaev Webb was, Webb was actually dominating the overall complexity of the algorithm. So our job was sort of to reduce the runtime complexity of, sorry, to reduce not just the runtime complexity, but the overall complexity of the, um, of the uh, Jordan, Jordan Lee Prescott algorithm. And we found a way to do this in quasi-linear time. And essentially the way that we did this was by recognizing that in Kitai of Web, they have a generic Gaussian state preparation routine, uh, which means that they, and the thing that dominates the classical complexity is doing what's called an LDL decomposition of the covariance matrix of the Gaussian state they're trying to prepare. But we recognize that in a particular case of quantum field theory, we actually know some things about the um, covariance matrix that we want to prepare. And so we can use that knowledge to ensure that the LDL decomposition step can be done in quasi-linear time. So that's to say order n times polynomial of n, where n is the number of um, modes in the system, I believe. So um, just to give a sense of what those algorithms look like, um, uh, these, these diagrams here sort of summarize what the main algorithms are. So one of them is a quantum Fourier transform based, well, not even a quantum Fourier transform, it's just a fast Fourier transform based approach. And another is a shear transformation, uh, is a, well, that's more complicated, but it essentially, both of these involve representing the uh, covariance matrix in some clever basis where we know something about its sparsity. Um, if we're being cheeky, we sort of know that, um, the, the system as it's presented in uh, Jordan Lee Preskill is periodic, which means that we can diagonalize with the Fourier transform, which is kind of all we're doing on the left hand side. And the interesting part of it is sort of to say, well, when would that not work and what would you do in 
uh, circumstances where that would not work. And the answer is if you break translational symmetry, then you should do something else. And we advocate for the use of a wavelet based transform, as, a wavelet transform as opposed to a Fourier transform, uh, which is robust against these kinds of, against imperfections that would break translational symmetry. Now, the key points to highlight in these two diagrams is that there's a classical component and a quantum component. So the classical component, component is on the top of the two pictures and the quantum component on the, is on the bottom. So on the, classic, on, on the classical side, this is basically some kind of a high level flow chart for what the classical computation is supposed to be. And then on the lower part is the uh, quantum part, which is simply to say, these are the quantum circuits that we are expecting to execute. And uh, so that's sort of a high level picture of the uh, algorithms. And then you can see that there's these like bubbles with the double lines in them. And this is where we have classical inputs. So the way, the way that we interpret these diagrams is that there's kind of a two-step processor. One of them is the compilation step where you've got some classical computer deciding what quantum circuit is to be executed on the quantum computer. So this means doing some kind of classical calculation and then based on the results of that classical calculation, designing a quantum circuit. Then once that quantum circuit is designed, the second step is just to execute the quantum circuit. So you have to count two different complexities here. One of them is what is the complexity of uh, doing the compilation of the quantum circuit itself. And the second is what is the runtime complexity of the circuit. So one of them is a classical computational cost. One of them is a quantum computational cost. So um, that, that, that I'm highlighting that because at some level, uh, what we're doing on the quantum computer is just a sparse matrix vector multiplication. So the idea is that, um, so that's not quite true of the uh, fast Fourier transform, but you can think of it as being like a sparse matrix vector multiplication. Um, the quantum shear transform that we're mentioning over there really is a sparse matrix vector multiplication. Uh, but the point is that um, if you look at those different rails in the uh, circuit diagram, you'll notice that the different rails are sort of like indicated as though they're elements of an array and that's not an accident. The idea is that there's uh, different arrays, there's some numerical operation that's being done to each element of the array, and then there's some overall operation to be done on the overall array, and this is taking a, this is equivalent to taking a sparse matrix and multiplying it by when you treat that array as a vector, you're doing a matrix vector multiplication. So that's what I mean by saying that the main quantum step is sparse matrix vector multiplication. And that is common across the two algorithms. So the origin of the speed up to be mentioning here is uh, it's, um, again, like I said, uh, the complexity of the LDLD composition was the thing that is, is the thing that dominates the Kitai of Web approach to Gaussian state preparation. And uh, when we're preparing the, um, uh, sorry, I just see that there's somebody to be admitted into the room. Um, I don't know if I can do, yeah, anyway, sorry. Okay, so, yeah, thanks. Um, so the Kitai of Web approach is basically to just, it, it only, it's designed to handle the generic case of a covariance matrix. So like any covariance matrix you like, think of it as being a dense matrix that you have to uh, do, you have to perform an LDL decomposition on. Uh, for those who don't know, the LDL decomposition is you take, it's sort of like diagonalizing a matrix, except you're not trying to look for some unitary operation uh, that, that turns the matrix into a diagonal matrix, what you're doing is you're looking for a lower triangular matrix uh, and a diagonal matrix such that the lower triangular matrix times the diagonal matrix times the transpose of that lower triangular matrix gives you the original matrix back. So it's sort of like a diagonalization, but not really. Um, so the fact that we know things about the covariance matrix is what's allowing us to reduce the complexity. Essentially what, it, what, essentially what we're doing is that we're taking the covariance matrix and treating it uh, as approximately a, a sparse matrix in terms of the number of non-zero entries. Uh, and then for some reason, and this is a thing that I will explain in some, some detail, um, for some reason that's 71 pages and four years of work, right? So at some point, all we're doing is saying, you should be thinking about this as a matrix, sparse matrix vector multiplication on a quantum computer. Why does that take 71 pages and why does that take four years of work? So notice that there's a common story between this paper and the last one, that there's this giant paper at the end of it. There's a whole bunch of person years of work by people who are pretty qualified at this. And uh, the overall story is actually kind of simple to tell. So what's going on here? Why are we spending 70 pages on things where like in like most physics journals, you sort of expect it to be like 10 pages or you like, if I can explain it so simply, what's the thing that's taking so long? So let's kind of analyze what's gone, what's gone well and what's not gone so well in this, um, in this uh, quantum field theory algorithms, uh, this quantum field theory algorithm paper. So, uh, there's, so, so when I'm talking about the good, the bad, and the ugly, I'm talking about good reasons for the paper to be uh, a long paper and to take a long time to write. I'm talking about bad reasons for uh, the paper to be long and take a long time to write. Uh, and the ugly is 
you'll see the ugly in a moment. Um, so the good reasons for the paper to be taking a long time to write and having a lot of content in it is that we, there's actually some novelty to the whole thing, right? So uh, the, we're, we're sort of uh, saying that the covariance matrix is supposed to be approximately sparse, which is to say you have some uh, truncation. Uh, basically, you throw away small entries. The result is approximately the same as the thing that you would have gotten if you hadn't thrown away those small entries. Uh, and you can represent this in some nice sparse array. So that's that all requires some like novel mathematics and that's sort of all in the paper um then there's also a new uh there, there's a new application of uh what i've taken to call it the inequality testing method for state preparation so this is a paper i did a couple of years back with dominic berry and it has myriad applications actually and it's um kind of uh once i find a little bit more time i'm actually going to try to write up something a bit more generic about saying how this kind of uh, thing would work in practice. And then also uh, another thing that we did in the paper that was, you know, good in the sense of like, you know, this is why we're writing papers is to show that there's a linear time lower bound for the problem. So when we say that it's an approximately optimal algorithm, we mean that we've got a quasi linear time algorithm for generating this vacuum state. And uh, we know that there's a lower bound that is exactly linear time. So anything that you can do to improve this is basically just knocking off poly polylogarithmic vacuums. Um, so those are good reasons for a long paper that takes a long time. Um, bad reasons for it is that we took the time, it, we, we, the, it is about the way that we're doing the complexity analysis. So basically what we had to do, it just you know, to wrap the project up at some useful point, uh, was to take a non-standard time complexity analysis. So what we did was we just came up with our own cost model that bears like little relation to what um, most other people would treat as a cost model. So for us, we had a unit cost assigned to basic arithmetic operations, to any operations that involved moving data between registers or, or from classical to quantum registers or vice versa, um, and primitive logic gates like Hadamard, Cnot, and Toffoli. Now, uh, the thing that's different from what a lot of people will think of when they talk about um, execution of quantum algorithms and the cost of that is that a lot of them will sort of say, oh, I'm just going to count each quantum gate like Hadamard, Cnot, and Toffoli as a unit cost, and then everything else has to be reduced down to those things. Um, they'll, sort of, they'll sort of implicitly be saying that I'm going to leave measurements till the end. And um, then if you're being a little bit more uh, uh, suave about it, then you might say, I'm only going to count Toffoli's because that's going to be what's going to incur a lot of the false tolerant overhead because Toffoli's are non-Clifford gates, whereas Hadamard and CNOS are Clifford gates. And uh, I believe that the error correcting code that will be used eventually by the quantum computer at the end of the day is going to be doing some kind of error correcting code that is going to uh, see Toffoli's as non not transversal, whereas Clifford's are going to be transversal, which means that uh, magic state synthesis is a big problem and that's going to dominate the cost. So we can hand wave all this away by saying, I can just count the cost of this algorithm by counting the number of Toffoli's. And that is exactly what we did in the combinatorial optimization paper. So if you just sort of think about that for like 20 seconds with a critical mind, you'll start to see where the ugly might come in. And in case you're not seeing it, here's exactly where the ugly is coming in. So let me just explain to you what it is that you're looking at here. What you're looking at here is a particular page in our uh, ground state generation paper. So this is the quantum field theory thing, right? And so this is, if we go back a couple of slides, actually, I will go back a couple of slides. If we look on the bottom right, there is this thing called QST in the second picture here, right? So QST stands for quantum shear transform. And the idea is that we just need to come up with some way of executing this quantum shear transform. And that's what this pseudocode is supposed to uh, explain. So the idea is that the inputs to this thing is that sort of like bubble of classical data. So the, that's the input line, that's the input side of this algorithm. The output side is supposed to be a quantum register in which the vacuum state is being prepared. Um, and uh, I shouldn't say that it's, yeah. And so then the idea is that uh, then this is just going through and explaining exactly how that shear transformation would work. And so you can see a whole bunch of like nested for loops and you can see that there's multiplications. Um, you can see that there's, um, uh, it, but then there, you, you, once you start sort of staring at this for a while, and believe me, I've stared at this for a while, um, there's, uh, there, there's other things going on here that you start to realize aren't really talked about very much in quantum algorithms research. So, for example, we're using a concept of quantum arrays. That is to say, it's an array data structure made out of quantum registers instead of classical registers. So you can see that, for example, in line 10, where we have a multiplication that takes as input some uh, temporary register called shear, which I'll get to in a moment. Um, the one, one um, location in what's, called the what, what's being called the vacuum um, array, it's not simply a register, it's, it's, a, it's an array of registers. And then the multiplication is involving 
information that is encoded into different parts of that array. So this is what's meant by VAC with the square brackets I and VAC with the square brackets two to the C plus J. Um, so that's an example of us using a higher order data structure. Um, and, and I'm just gonna call it a quantum array for the sake of this discussion. Um, another thing that we're doing is, for example, on line four, we're doing variable initialization. So we're introducing this temporary variable called shear, and it is a quantum variable in the sense that it is a register that is storing a temporary value that is calculated classically. Um, and then you'll also notice that we have to be careful to erase. So in line four, we encode classical information into a quantum register. And in line six, we uh, erase that information by basically doing the same operation again. So we presume that that operation is a self inverse operation. You do it twice, you've done nothing. So the purpose of line six is to uncompute line four. And what you realize when you really think about this for way too long, well, it's not really way too long because I kind of have to, but um, what you realize is that there is an implicit thing going on here, which is that once, you're got, once you've gone through an iteration of the for loop, you can deallocate the shear register. Um, now, you can, you can in principle just sort of reuse it. So it's, I'm not saying that like your actual sort of low level operational code should be uh, deallocating and reallocating memory in exactly the way I just said. But the point is that there's the fact that there is this consistent reuse of the shear variable suggests that there's various compiler optimizations one could do. One could pre compute uh, a whole, uh, one could pre store uh, the classical information into various different registers, each of which is sort of being iteratively called shear. And then there's a memory management uh, side of this whole algorithm that is being swept under the rug at this high level of analysis. And um, let, so, so there's a lot of really interesting concepts here, but I just want to just make it really crystal clear why this is ugly, if it's not already obvious why this is ugly because of just like how big this thing is. Um, so one of the reasons that this is ugly is because uh, the pseudocode that you're seeing over here, um, it has to presume many concepts that I don't think anybody has actually defined anywhere. So things like quantum arrays, variable initialization, uncomputation is sort of defined, but not very well. And memory management is a whole can of worms that I think is basically untouched in quantum algorithms research. It, I, I could be wrong. Could be that there's a whole bunch of like quantum memory management stuff out there, but I haven't found it. Um, and then, uh, th so, so, and then these like sort of concepts that aren't really well defined. The reason why I know that they're not very well defined is because there's no clearly stated underlying computational model. We made an attempt to do so in the paper, but we essentially just hand waved around a paper that Ming Sheng wrote like a year or two ago now about like basically saying, oh, it's all just the QRAM model where QRAM is quantum random access machine, not quantum random access memory. And we hand wave because um, that's kind of, I mean, unless we were going to write a, like a paper that was like two or three times as long explaining what was our computational model, we just had to do what everybody else in literature does, which is to just fudge it. And, and I don't like fudging things. This bothers me. Um, and all of this sort of leads to this problem that there's actually a limited ability to, to express high level programming concepts, which is what gives rise to the ridiculous length and time taken to write these sorts of papers. Because at some point, all I'm showing you in this algorithm nine, this you know, 40 line thing with all of these like weird concepts going on, all this is, is a sparse matrix vector multiplication. All this is doing is saying, hey, here is a matrix that is defined, defined as a sparse matrix, which is to say in the dictionary of keys representation, if that means anything to you. And all I want to do is take that classical matrix and multiply it to a quantum array. Right, so it's really a matrix vector multiplication. It's just that the vector is quantum and you want to do this multiplication in place. This is a very standard idea and to come up with it isn't really tricky, but to write it down and cost it out, we have to answer at least, we have to sort of hand wave through these uh, questions that nobody has actually answered in the literature, at least as far as I know. So to summarize the point here, to summarize this sort of like first part of the talk, um, the, the issue that we face in quantum algorithms research is that it's not so much the problem of coming up with algorithms, it's the problem of expressing them. So you sort of feel a bit like Neo in the Matrix, if anybody's, if that move, movie isn't too old for people, which is that like, there's this scene where um, a, Agent Smith says to Neo, you know, what good is a phone call if you're unable to speak? And then Neo's mouth sort of uh, covers up. And it, it's sort of like this problem where we, we can think the things that we're talking about in quantum algorithms research. It's not that difficult in some sense. We can just come up with a high level idea about how this thing is supposed to work. But the part where we express how this would work on a quantum computer and what it's going to cost for a quantum computer to execute, it's, it takes so long just to explain ourselves because we're just stumbling over a lack of language here. So this is sort of like the main takeaway I'm hoping that you'll, you'll take from this. And then the rest of this is essentially about really hammering the point home to anybody who isn't convinced. So 
I'm going to switch from exhibit A, which was that, that previous algorithm, to exhibit B, which is the sort of more comprehensive picture of what it is that we accomplished in the combinatorial optimization paper. So what we did, and the reason this took so bloody long is because um, there are four different, we, we looked at four different kinds of cost functions. This is like four different problem domains, buckets, where you can draw problems from that kind of thing. Uh, and then for each one, we had five different, well, there's actually more than five different heuristics, but we're only reporting on a few of them here. Um, there's various different heuristics that one can do. And then there is some, uh, in, in each of those like heuristic approaches to combinatorial optimization, we identify some uh, subroutine that the quantum computer is probably going to take the most time to do. And then we figure out how the quantum computer is going to do that subroutine. And then we figure out what the cost is in terms of various problem parameters, including, by the way, a lot of working precision terms that you see is like B sub whatever here. So uh, there's different calculations in which there needs to be a working precision, which I'll explain in a bit. Um, and uh, the result is this giant mess of calculations, which we're sort of having to go through and do by hand uh, in a very haphazard way. And um, uh, just to really drive this home, I, I'm actually going to take you through what one line of this looks like. So let's. So what I'm going to do is I'm not going to worry about exactly which, which cost function you use. I'm just going to highlight these zeggity walk annealing steps. So if you look in the algorithm primitives, there's a list of six things. Uh, the fourth the fourth one is zeggity walk. You notice that it's sort of repeated. So what what's meant by zeggity walk annealing step is uh, we're taking an idea that was discussed by Rolando Soma and a couple of others back in uh, well it was published in 2008 but the archive paper is 2007. So essentially the idea is that one can do simulated annealing by doing Markov chain Monte Carlo, and one can do Markov chain Monte Carlo by implementing a walk of, of basically, one can do Monte, Markov chain Monte Carlo on a quantum computer by implementing the Markov operator as a zeggity walk. So um, the idea is that the job of the um, quantum simulated annealing in this context is uh, each, step, each, each step of the cooling is done by performing this quantum version of Markov chain Monte Carlo. And the idea is that we can prepare a coherent version of the stable distribution, which is supposed to be some Gibbs distribution, like a temperature distribution, um, but coherentized. So instead of it being a probability distribution, it's some coherent state where the amplitudes are the square roots of the probabilities. And so this can be done in order uh, one on square root delta walk steps where delta is the spectral gap. And then this is to be contrasted with order one on delta Markov transitions to get the stable distribution and like or normal Markov chain Monte Carlo. Um, so, uh, so then the idea is that for us, like for the, you know, the co-authors of that paper, we're just trying to say, okay, well, how would you actually do this on a quantum computer? And so our main job, if you sort of boil that down a bit, if you know anything about Zegedee walks, the main job is actually to construct an appropriate state preparation routine. And before I get into exactly how that looks, um, I just want to point out that this result about uh, doing simulated annealing via Zegedee walk is, is essentially superseded by a more recent paper doing quantum metropolis hastings. So if anybody knows the metropolis hastings algorithm, this is basically a way of doing um, Markov chain Monte Carlo uh, without having to calculate too many probability, transitional probabilities. Uh, and um, there's, there's this pretty interesting paper that came out uh, from the group of W. Pallon before he passed. Uh, so it's worth looking at. And we did cost that out too. So this is just to say. So how do we prepare that state? Given that that's, the, in some sense, the overall bottleneck routine, what we do is we sort of say, OK, well, we're going to, like, fundamentally, we're going to think very hard, and we're going to come up with a sequence of steps. Now, I'm not going to bore you with all, what all the steps are and why those steps are the steps that they are. Uh, what I want to do is I want to give a sense of how many uh, complicated and even, like I would, I would suggest, undefined concepts are actually at play when we're doing this cost analysis. So what I've done is there's a total of uh, 11 steps in this story. And what I want to do is rather than sort of just read and explain to you what each step is, I want to just give a sense of what concepts are at work at each stage of the algorithm. So in step one, uh, there's this uh, calling a, a quantum subroutine to compute transition probability. So what that means is that uh, in order to decide whether we're going to go from one candidate solution to the next candidate solution, we're only going to transition with some probability. There's some, uh, there's some, uh, function involving basic arithmetic, it's, you know, it's probably the exponential of a difference or a ratio of exponentials or something like this um, that you have to calculate. And so what we're doing is we're saying, okay, let's suppose we've already figured out what that is. It's going to depend on exactly what the problem, uh, the problem domain is, but uh, the idea is that we just need to figure out, okay, we're going to just, just calculate that transition probability. And that is in some sense, a quantum subroutine call. Okay. That's not so bad. Um, but then the idea is that we're doing this iteratively in a sense, because the idea is that the input and the output have to have different um, working precisions, because if you think about how arithmetic is supposed to work on a quantum computer, um, everything is supposed to be reversible, including arithmetic. 
But what that means is that if you're doing arithmetic to finite precision, um, then you start to build up uncertainty as you go through various operations. So the idea is that what we're saying in that is that the input needs to have more bits of precision than the output. And this is a concept called including guard bits. So, uh, so then the idea is that the, the arithmetic is as you are sequentially doing arithmetic operations, you are actually losing precision over time and you have to keep track of what working precision you're supposed to be doing at each step of the arithmetic operation. So even that supposedly simple idea, there's actually quite a lot going on there if we're going to try and cost everything out. So in the second step, um, there's also this introduction of temporary ancilla. So these there's in equation 175, we see that there are these various different qubits, the qubits uh, being added, um, it, and they're sort of being conjured up from nowhere. Like, you know, we didn't start with those in the algorithm. It's that we want to sort of borrow them from some like, um, data, some, some like a uh, bank of, of, you know, of qubits that we can just borrow for a bit uh, with a promise to return them later uh, once we've erased them. Um, and that's sort of what I mean by having introduced temporary ancillas. We also have to partition the memory into registers. So the idea is that we're going to clump together some group of qubits and say, you are in fact going to behave as though you are like all one unit as opposed to like several different qubits that have to be addressed independently. In step three, uh, there's, there's, the, um, uh, there, there's sort of this requirement to prepare an equal superposition state. And, uh, if you're actually aware of quantum algorithms research, so if it's a power of two number of qubits, then you just do a round of Hadamard's. But if it's not a power of two, then it's one of these uh, techniques that everybody knows, but everybody has to rederive every time they write a damn paper, which is how do you prepare an even superposition across a non-power of two number of possible states? And uh, you have to think about that a bit because it actually involves a round of amplitude amplification, which is surprising. Um, then uh, one, one other thing that's sort of going on in step three is that there's the creation of entanglement between ancilla registers. So whatever operation we did there, in this case, it was like a controlled operation. Uh, so it, it wasn't just that simply that we were preparing an equal superposition state, it's that we were deciding whether or not to prepare that equal superposition state as controlled by some other qubit, which, which may or may not have been in a computational basis state. And in fact, it was arranged so that it was not. So what this is doing is it's creating entanglement between different ancillas. And you should keep that in mind because if we throw away the ancillas at the wrong time, then we've effectively introduced noise in our system because throwing away part of an entangled state manifests as noise in the remaining registers. So um, the fact that there's that entanglement means that we have to keep track of it in our heads somewhere so that we can erase it later. Step four, I'll just sort of point out that there's a binary to unary conversion. So this is two different quantum data types. So there's, even, even though it sort of seems relatively simple, there is this, this, this concept of a data type that's coming out in step four. Step five, uh, we're again seeing variable, variable precision arithmetic with guard bits. Uh, I'll also sort of point out, because I haven't really before, that there's a multi-register quantum operation going on, which is that uh, we're supposed to calculate the square of a number. Uh, if you think about it for a bit, you realize calculating the square of a number is a non-reversible operation because of the finite precision requirements. Uh, so you have to actually add additional register in there. Other, you can't do an in-place square, is my point. Um, multi-register quantum operation uh, in step six. This is a controlled uh, inequality test. So controlled on the qubit labeled C, uh, compare the two numbers A and B, which are promised to be you know, n-bit integers or something. Uh, and then you've got an output qubit at the right zero. Uh, and the idea is that this is supposed to be, uh, so the, the square brackets there are the Iverson brackets. So this is basically just recording whether or not A is less than B and is only recording that if C is one, otherwise it will not record it. Uh, step seven is, um, uh, again, we're using the same multi-register quantum operation. And I'll also point out a sort of habit that happens in uh, quantum algorithms papers, which is in equations 179 and 80, which are actually technically the same equation. That's actually a mistake on our part. Um, uh, I think 179 should not be numbered at all. Uh, and what's going on here is that we're sort of asserting that this is the state that we get, but this isn't really actually the state that we get. What this is is part of an overall superposition because the registers that we're looking at, we're ignoring certain registers. And because we're ignoring certain registers, there's actually entanglement between these registers, what, what we're seeing over here and some other part of the quantum memory. So in fact, we're kind of lying to you when we're saying that this is the state because it isn't. It's some part of a larger superposition. So just to say, this is actually very much a habit in quantum algorithms papers that we have to sort of inspect part of the states to say, this is why what we're doing is working. Um, even though we're kind of not being, we're being a bit cagey about the fact that there's actually entanglement to be managed, which has to be erased. And in step eight, this is where we're thinking about the erasure stuff, which is that we have to do uncomputation in order to erase a register. So the idea is that we want to free up this register called ZZ, and we're going to um, come up with some way to erase that register 
in such a way that it also breaks the entanglement and doesn't create noise elsewhere in the quantum memory. So uh, I would also point out that because we're freeing up that register, there's an implied deallocation of quantum memory. So this is the last one. Um, so step nine, again, we're going to do on computation in order to erase the register. And again, there's this implied deallocation of quantum memory. In step 10, we're, we're again doing this inspection of part of the quantum memory, even when there's entanglement with other parts of the quantum memory. Uh, and then step 11 is actually the one that there's most to say about, which means I'm going to say the least about it, uh, which is that it's a quantum macro instruction. So um, just to summarize in some sense, what's a very big, long, complicated story, which uh, if it exhausts you, it should exhaust you. If it doesn't exhaust you, you're my hero and I want to work with you on something. But um, the high level quantum programming concepts that we're seeing here uh, are things like memory allocation and deallocation. We're seeing quantum data structures. Now, I didn't mention this particular data structure, but one of the most important ones in the last few years is something called QROM, uh, which is, you know, the, the, it, the, the name suggests that it's some kind of a memory thing, but in fact, it's a, it's a quantum queryable list. So I, I, uh, it's a classical list, but you, it's done in such a way that you can query, uh, query a quantum superposition of elements. Um, there's also various things like type conversion and type aware operations. So what I mean by type conversions is that binary to unary thing. So there's different ways of representing an integer. So you can think about it as being signed versus unsigned, or you can think I'm going to represent it in a binary. I'm going to have some like list of, uh, list of bits where they're all going to be zero, except exactly one of them is going to be one and where the one is, is going to tell you what the number is. Uh, there's also type aware operations. So you can imagine doing arithmetic on those things and those operate, the, the way that you're going to actually do arithmetic is going to be dependent on your choice of encoding of data. Uh, there's other concepts going on here, like register erasure by uncomputation, which is necessary for a clean deallocation, which is to say, if I bring in an ancilla qubit and it was clean to start off with, I want to make sure that I'm returning it to the ancilla bank in a clean state. Um, there are circumstances where we can get away with dirty. And in fact, when you're doing multi-precision arithmetic, you are doing dirty deallocation. Uh, it's, it can be managed if you're really, really careful, but it is a way that I've seen, like when I review papers, for example, a lot of the times I'll say this algorithm doesn't work because you didn't like keep track of your dirty, dirty register deallocation. So um, it's actually, so it's, it's actually a tell when it's actually a tell. So if you look at somebody who's writing a quantum algorithms paper, one of the tells that they don't know what they're talking about is that they don't understand the distinction between clean and dirty register deallocation. Um, and this is, by the way, my name for it. I'm like, you're going to find that name in the literature. And the final one that I point out, which is, again, I think there's a lot to say about this, which is why I'm saying basically nothing about it, um, is uh, metaprogramming. So the idea is that, for example, amplitude amplification is actually a kind of macro instruction. So if you're familiar with the term metaprogramming, then there's actually quite a lot of quantum metaprogramming that happens in quantum algorithms research, and it's sort of hand waved aside. It's never really carefully defined. Okay, so at this point, you might be thinking, okay, Yuval, thanks a lot for all the complaints, uh, but isn't this your job? And, you know, like maybe this is sort of the mindset that you have here, which is that, look, you're doing quantum physics. Of course, it's hard. And the answer is the answer that I would give to this kind of objection is that there's certain parts of this that we expect to be hard. There's certain parts of this that we expect are just going to take smart people a bunch of time to think about and figure out. And, you know, this is the whole scientific process. And there are good reasons for that. But there are also bad reasons for that, which is really the reason why our papers are so long, why they take so long to write, and uh, why there's so much wrong information out there about what quantum algorithms can or can't do. We don't have a good language for talking about it is essentially the summary. So good reasons for spending a lot of human effort in terms of designing algorithms is um, we can define problems for which there might be quantum advantage. So um, we might sort of think, okay, maybe a quantum computer is going to be good at combinatorial optimization, or maybe quantum computers are going to be good at um, simulating quantum field theory. Okay, that's a question you pose to a human. You ask the human, you know, what do you think, what do you think can be done with a quantum computer in this circumstance? And they come up with various ideas and they sort of try to think of something. Okay, perfectly appropriate that that might be hard, that might take a long time for a human, all this sort of stuff. Okay. Um, then once they sort of the, the, the idea is that what they're doing is they're trying to deliver some kind of an approach. So in our particular case, this image over here I'm giving you is sort of a summary of the approach that we took in the quantum field theory papers. So the idea is that this is a depiction of the covariance matrix that we can work with in a wavelet basis. And it is not exactly the covariance matrix, it is approximately the covariance matrix. So the key point here is that the number of non-zero entries in this matrix, so as indicated by pixels that are not white, um, is uh, is uh, so if the if the if it, this is an n by n matrix, then the number of uh, non-zero the, the number of non-zero pixels is order n log n basically, um, and uh, and so then the idea is that because the number of pixels is order n log n, then the cost of taking this matrix and multiplying it in place to a, some vector 
is only order n log n because you can just skip any operation that involves multiplying by zero or adding zero because uh, that doesn't do anything. So um, this is the sense in which, yes, you expect humans to do this because you expect humans to be the ones to understand physics enough to come up with some approach to the problem that's going to lead to a speed up. Okay, no problem. Then you have to say, well, actually, this isn't really the covariance matrix. This is approximately the covariance matrix. You might have to do some mathematical analysis to prove that your approximations don't build up too badly uh, and that you're still sort of getting the thing that you're expecting to get. And again, this is a perfectly valid reason for uh, humans to be spending a lot of time on quantum algorithms research. No problem at all. Uh, finally, you also say, okay, but now once you've come up with this algorithm, you're supposed to do the complexity analysis. You're supposed to say how expensive this thing is as a matter, uh, as a sort of, as some sort of a, uh, an analytic function of the input parameters, right? So it's not just enough to say, oh, I tried it on this instance, I tried it on this instance, I tried it on this instance. I need to say that there's some kind of, like, I, generally speaking, I want to say, what is the asymptotic complexity of this thing? How, or, or even more precisely, I want to say how the complexity of these things scales as the size of my problem increases. And again, all of these are good reasons for human effort, but there's a bunch of things that we're doing that isn't really very reasonable for human effort, at least to the level that we're doing it. So these are some thoughts about like sort of what I would boil down all of these uh, if, complaints, if you will, uh, into what it is that we're doing in these quantum algorithms papers uh, that really shouldn't be done by humans, or at least not so frequently done by humans. Um, so one of them is that we're spending a lot of time in these quantum algorithms papers arguing about what is our execution model. So when we talk about describing a quantum algorithm, what is the machine that we have in mind that is executing that thing? And I don't mean machine in the sense of, oh, you know, Google has a bunch of superconducting qubits, or IonQ has a bunch of ions, or uh, Xanadu has a bunch of photonic, whatever the hell they are. You know, I'm not talking at that level. I'm talking that there is this picture of, it is a thing that executes quantum circuits. What actually is the thing? Is there some notion of, is there a classical coprocessor with it? Uh, what does it mean to assign a variable? What, what do you have to worry about in terms of memory allocation and deallocation? There's a whole question mark around this uh, where we just simply don't have that execution model and we're all kind of hand-waving our way around it and we're all coming up with different answers. Um, another opportunity for improvement is that at some point, a lot of what we're doing is to express things that have already been very well expressed in uh, classical programming languages. So, for example, the concept of an array. Um, in, in, the, in, in, in a lot of the papers I write, I sort of have to belabor the point, here is what I mean by a quantum array. With the QRONT thing, I can tell you in a sentence that it is a quantum queryable list, but you won't find that definition anywhere in the literature. You won't find anybody explaining it to you in that way. And this is because we lack the language to express the widgets that we are creating along the path to figuring out what a quantum computer is doing. And because we lack the language to express those widgets, we have to spend a lot of pages and time explaining what they are, how they work, and we sort of do it for every algorithm that we're describing. So this is what pads out the page count. Another thing that we should really avoid doing is reinventing the wheel, um, which is, so for example, in the ground state generation paper, this quantum field theory thing that I did, um, the uh, reinventing the wheel that's sort of happening there is that we're going through and we're explaining very carefully how a quantum computer would do an in-place sparse matrix vector multiplication. That is why that particular algorithm that I showed was sort of long and tedious. But it didn't really have anything to do with the particular matrix that we were doing. It was merely the idea that you have a uh, dictionary of keys representation of a sparse matrix presented to you classically, and you wish to multiply that, that matrix to a target quantum register. And at some point that should be a one-liner, but it isn't. Um, so then given that these are sort of like the three that I would highlight as being the main opportunities for improvement, um, what is it that we're supposed to do about that? Like, like what, what's, the, what's the sort of practical consequences in terms of research? So in terms of execution model, I think the really um, problematic part of this is that we really haven't given enough thought to uh, memory models and quantum computing. As far as I can tell, this is a completely untapped area of research. Uh, in terms of the programming language, um, you know, there's, there's, you know, the, the it, GitHub is full of the graveyard of a bunch of failed quantum language design uh, 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 things. And then uh, the industry is, you know, if, if uh, was, apologies, is there any industry people in the audience, but uh, industry is full of a bunch of soon to be dead projects of this kind. You know, there's the KISS kits and there's the CERCs and the Q sharps and whatever. And you can just look at how people are using them to realize that these are ultimately not doing the job that people like me are using. Because how would, if I was to express the quantum algorithms that I'm describing, 
I wouldn't be using Qiskit. That's not a use, because I'd have to design the circuit before I can even touch something like Qiskit. Um, instead of that, I'm effectively using pen and paper to design my algorithms. So, um, this, so there's this lack of a high level programming language, but you know, people have tried before, why can we succeed now? And the reason is because of the recent unification of quantum algorithms that I'll discuss in a moment. Um, and then the last one about standard libraries, just to say is that um, there's plenty of standard libraries out there. There's plenty of problems that have been solved in the classical world. A lot of these can be ported without much change to the quantum world. The only thing that really needs the work, or it's not the only thing, but the major thing that needs the work is to uh, distinguish between this clean versus dirty deallocation of uh, temporary registers. So the quantum memory management is really sort of a, a tricky point here. But in some sense, it's the, it's the main tricky point, and there's not much else that's tricky about it outside of that. Uh, so um, the sort of main practical takeaway I'd suggest to you is that it might be time to design a high level quantum programming language. And the reason why I think it's time now as opposed to say a few years ago is because there's been um, this recent development over the last few years in quantum algorithms research. Um, and so it comes out from this paper uh, I'm alluding to on the left. So I'm giving the archive reference, but in fact, this was published in Fox or Stock, one of those two. I don't remember which one's which, sorry. Um, but uh, the idea is that, so it's called the quantum singular value transformation and beyond. Uh, and this is um, what uh, Ike Chuang and others on the right have been calling a grand unification of quantum algorithms, which is very apt. It's an extremely important paper. Uh, I don't know how many people outside of quantum algorithms are aware of this work from Gillian and Sue and Lo and Weeb. Uh, but the, what they've really done is they've taken a lot of ways that people approach the design and uh, the, the uh, design of quantum algorithms and unify them into a single framework. It's not universal, uh, but it's pretty close. And um, just to give a sense of what that looks like, I've picked on a particular paper that came out of Microsoft. I think it was recently published in some journal, Physics Review something. Um, and uh, this, is, this is extracted from the uh, supplemental material of that paper. By the way, that paper is over 100 pages too. So you know, just, just, just in case you thought that, that they, other people are writing shorter papers than I, they're really not. Um, so you can sort of see that this is the way that they're talking about the algorithms they're describing. So, so this is sort of two sequential pages in the paper, and you can see sort of on the left that they're coming up with these sort of low level widgets in the form of diagrams. And then the idea is that as they build up these low level widgets, they build up more complicated widgets by sticking together these low level widgets in certain ways. And this is the beginnings. It's not all the way there. And by the way, Guang Hao is a co-author on this one. So it's not like, you know, like he's a co-author on the singular value stuff as well. So he knows what he's talking about. Um, he's also, he was a PhD student of Mike Chuang. So the point is that the, the, the fledgling sort of attempts to build a language are actually already starting to happen. It's just that we need to capture this in a formal language that we're all agreeing to. In some sense, we need the C programming language for quantum computing. Okay, I'll open it up to questions and argumentation. Thanks. Okay, thanks, Yvonne. Uh, any, any questions? Um, Hello, can I, can I have a question? Of course. Uh, sure, uh, uh, thanks for the talk. This is, uh, this is very exciting. So I have a, first I have a, a technical question. Um, uh, in terms of the sparse matrix multiplication, so how do you yeah. actually do it in your paper? Like, uh, like uh, just- it, Oh, it's, it's not a very sensible way. To be clear, this is not a very sensible way. Um, okay. this, is, this is purely about just explaining how it's being done. We are not trying to do this in the most sensible way. So I can explain it if you want, but it's basically the most boneheaded way you'd imagine. So, so. yeah, sure, sure. As far as I know, especially the, the QSVT paper, and, and I mean, yeah. normally it's just done by blocking coding first, and then you just apply the unitary onto your vector. I mean, given yeah, so we have to distinguish between two things. So yeah, so I think I know where you're going. That's why I'm interrupting. But um, there's a distinction between two things. So and, and I can sort of summarize it by saying, do you know the difference between a quantum Fourier transform and a quantum fast Fourier transform? Uh, me personally, not not. Yes, not, you personally. Yeah. Sorry. Right. So Sorry. The, the reason I'm asking is because I need to explain the difference. The quantum Fourier transform is something where you're manipulating the amplitudes of a quantum state vector. The quantum fast Fourier transform is when you were executing the fast Fourier transform on a quantum computer. And what I mean by the fast Fourier transform is that your input data structure is an array. For the quantum Fourier transform, your input is just simply a single register. But for the fast Fourier transform, your input is an array of registers. So what I'm talking about, what I'm talking about doing a sparse matrix vector multiplication is that I really am talking about an array of quantum registers, not a single quantum register. So 
uh, now maybe in the singular value paper, they do talk about that. And, you know, look, it's, it's, it's a complicated paper. I, I haven't, I, I think I've been through most of it at some point, but I mean, it's been a while and it's a complicated paper. Yeah, so yeah. Maybe you're, yeah, go on. No, no, no I, I was just wondering how do you, so say just, just a very the basic example of multiplying a matrix to a vector on, on quantum oh. computer. Oh, yeah, <laughs> I was talking about that and normally- Oh, just, oh uh, I see, yeah. Yeah, so the answer is basically, let's suppose that you're presented with the uh, sparse matrix as being a dictionary of keys representation. So what that means for those who don't know is you've got a list of entries in the matrix that are non-zero together with values, right? So you've, you've got an associative array. Uh, the uh, keys are pairs of, of there are locations in the yeah, matrix. Yeah, I, of values yeah. Are, yeah. So, so then the idea is that for each of those things, there is a particular uh, addition uh, multiplication operation that is supposed to be done. So all that this algorithm is doing is just unwinding all of those multiplications that you're supposed to be doing plus addition operations. So if you think about it, each one of those can be thought of as a small two by two matrix where it's like one, one, and then a non zero thing on the top right. And that's just add and multiply in place kind of thing. So it breaks it down into a bunch of arithmetic operations. And that's really all that's being unwound in this algorithm over here. Again, I said it was boneheaded. Yeah, I, th I thought the most difficult part is actually the block encoding because, uh, and my question so there's was- There's nothing being block encoded here. Okay. So but block encoding is a very different concept. Block encoding is the concept where you have a non-unitary operation that you wish to apply to a quantum register and yeah. you want to okay. insert it into some larger unitary. Everything that I'm describing is a unitary operation. Okay, so it's not, the sparse it's not, matrix but, you are referring to is a unitary sparse matrix. Uh, it is not a unitary matrix, but it is an invertible matrix. But again, the point is not, is the reason why we care about unitary operations is because that's what you can do in individual quantum I, I, registers. I, I knew, I knew. I, I guess, I, I, I'm sorry, but I guess uh, my, maybe I was not clear at first place. So it was like, say, for example, you want to multiply a non-unitary matrix to a vector. And then the normally the first step you do is to, Block encode that non-unitary matrix no, into no, no, no. This, So this is where you're making the mistake, and, and it's a very important thing to point out. Um, that when when you are when you are doing block encoding of an operation, that operation is not a matrix being applied to a vector. It is a uh, desired op operation to be effected on a quantum register. So the idea is that you're trying to do a state transformation, and we do represent states with vectors, but that is not what I mean by a vector. What I mean by a vector is an array of quantum registers. Okay, so there are two completely different concepts here. Right, right. Uh, I'm really sorry. I, I, I misunderstood, but now I get it. No, that, that's fine. But, but this is good because I, I misunderstood this myself for several, for a couple of months when I was trying to study the Kitaev web paper. That is, in fact, what they're doing in the Kitaev web paper. They are talking about matrix vector multiplications in the sense that I'm talking about. But normally in quantum computing, we talk about matrix vector mul multiplications in the sense that you're talking about, which is a completely different concept. And you don't <laughs> okay. have the language for them. Yeah. Right. right. Thank yeah. you so much. I, I yeah, really no worries. And, and, cool. and, and in speaking of the language, uh, sorry, the library that you were talking about, mm -hmm. uh, for, for example, we, we do lack a lot of like the meta programming like operations in, 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 in the libraries. And for example, like almost no one has done the actual implementation of the block encoding of a matrix. Like I cannot find any implementation online. So I think that should be the foundation of a high level programming language. So kind of like how, like, you know, everything is a list in Lisp. I think everything is a block encoding in a good high level quantum programming language. <laughs> the QSVT stuff. Yeah. yeah. All right. Yeah. 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 So yeah, I, I highlight the QSVT stuff for a reason. I do I, like, I do agree that it's sort of a grand unified principle of quantum algorithms, um, but it's, Taking taking that concept and turning it into a full blown quantum programming language is actually quite a lot of work, and it's it needs to be kind of a whole what, whole community effort, I think. Yes, 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 and I guess we need to convince people that QSVT is indeed somehow you know like a valuable stuff that we need to take it seriously. Well, we've got Ike Chuang in our corner, so that's good. Yeah, I knew, but but I guess especially some people that I've been talking to are like you know afraid of like approaching QSVT because the, the, like the complicated steps, uh, no, not because the algorithm, I guess it's because the implementation, uh, say it's, they prefer, yeah. yeah, they prefer the data encoding in terms of rotation angles instead of like amplitude. Oh. I mean, yeah. Does that make sense? It's Go, uh, yeah, and, and if you ever want to get a really amusing a reaction from somebody, just go tell Dominic about that and he'll just go, oh, yeah. 
Yeah, so that's my exactly my 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 reaction as well. But yeah. I, I guess this is some you know. I mean, there exists people in. I mean, they they do think that way. So I I don't know how to change that. Oh, so you, this, you show them you show them why you're smarter than them, and the way you show them why you're smarter no, than them is that you think that they can't the do. Is, they think they are. Uh, they, they are, I, I, I think I still stopped talking about it, but, but this is... <laughs> it sounds like we have lots to talk about, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, but, but I okay, guess... Okay, uh, let's maybe uh, move on. Yeah, uh, sorry. Maria, Maria's yes. waiting. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> yes, yes, Maria's been patiently waiting. Sorry about this. Uh, yeah, yeah, so you don't, we, you, you and I should chat at some point, and I'm actually at UTS right now if you want to come find me. Okay, cool. I'll, I'll reach out to you uh, later. Thank you so yeah, much. Yeah, just email me and we'll set up something. Yeah, cool, thanks. Okay. Uh, thanks. Yeah, so I have a question to steer up some trouble. Uh, thanks for the, the, the explanation about why arithmetics and all of these, we want to call simple operations are so difficult to do on a quantum computer. And the lesson that you took from all of these papers is that we need to create a better quantum programming language. So we mm -hmm. have to do it manually. But another lesson that other people uh, might be taking is that quantum computers simply aren't good at arithmetics or sparse matrix, uh, sparse matrix vector multiplication. And therefore, we shouldn't even attempt to do these things on a quantum computer. And instead, we should focus on hybrid algorithms where all of this stuff would be done classically and the quantum computer would be only evaluating some objective function. I know, I see that you are- You're playing you're, advocate, right? Uh, yes, uh, I yeah. just really like your answer on record for this. <laughs> I, this is still going to YouTube, isn't it? Um, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, nah, screw it. So, yeah, um, the, the problem is that if a quantum computer is supposed to beat a supercomputer, you kind of expect that it's gonna be doing arithmetic somewhere. Like you, you just don't expect that a quantum computer is going to go out there and going to beat like a, a you know, teraflop supercomputer, whatever it is, uh, by doing like zero flops, right? Like, yeah. well, you can work with a supercomputer by letting the supercomputer do the arithmetic. But sometimes, you, sometimes you need to do arithmetic coherently. Like in particular, if you're going to use like a, a Grover search style thing for like um, uh, comb to draw optimization to take a particularly a uh, naive and dumb idea that keeps coming up in the literature because it's kind of an obvious idea to try and then people just don't realize why it's a bad idea, uh, is that um, you sort of think, okay, well, if you're gonna do like a Grover search style approach, then you're going to have to come up with some Oracle that tells you what's the cost of different possible candidate solutions to a thing. You, you kind of expect that if you're gonna calculate out the cost of a thing, you might have to add two numbers together somewhere in the line. So like they can try to sweep it under the rug, but sooner or later you expect a computer to be able to like add numbers together. And um, it's not a question of whether a quantum computer is bad or good at it, it's that it has to do it one way or another. Thank you. So, yeah, bit snarky, but I, I, I find it hard not to be snarky with uh, with this idea that, a, that a, we don't expect a quantum computer to add numbers, that's ridiculous. Have I uh, more somebody people? else? Gregory? <laughs> Good. Good. Uh, yeah, you're, go uh, hi, hi. Oh, go yeah, ahead. Yeah. You're muted. Oh, you're muted. Let me do that again. I had to open my PC to get the camera to work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. no problem at all. Yeah, no problem. Um, what's given the um, given the kind of limitations that we have at the moment on um, uh, qubit size, actual qubits, actual physical qubits available in quantum computers in the wild as we know them at the moment? Mm -hmm. What sort of limitations do you see, that, or what sort of breaks do you see that putting on the kind of abstract programming language that you're talking about? Is this a cart before the horse kind of problem? Huh. Uh, that's an interesting question. Um, the response is that it's not a cart before the horse problem, it's that you have to pay for the ship before the ship can take off. So the issue is that as we're developing quantum computers, the promise is that quantum computers are supposed to be better than classical computers. And um, the thing is that classical computers are actually really good. Like, like right now, like if you just think about the number of calculations that your computer is doing to allow me to talk to you and my computer is doing to talk to you and all this, that's a lot of calculations. And so 
quantum computers are at like a 50 to 100 year disadvantage in terms of technology. So the overall question is, at what point does this investment pay off? And in what way does it pay off? And that kind of analysis requires that we have some knowledge about what a quantum computer can and can't do better than a classical computer, even if we don't have the technology yet. So the purpose of the language is not to say what we would do with today's technology. The purpose of the language is to say what would we do with that technology in five years time, 10 years time, 15 years time, 20 years time. And at some point, if uh, we're still stuck having to figure out what each qubit is supposed to do each and every single time. People like me are going to get really sick of it if we have to figure out what we're supposed to do with a million qubit quantum computer, if we're designing operations for each and every single qubit. We need some help on this, and it's help that can be given by robots instead of humans. So let's get robots to do it, right? Yeah, if I, if I think about, uh, and, and I'm trying not to get away from the topic here, if I think about the kind of flame wars that have been going on for the last decade, probably two decades, about yep. expressivity of, mm -hmm. uh, or, of, of syntax or the actual preferred paradigm for, for programming that, that's supposedly mm -hmm. captured in these various languages, do you think that's going to muddy the waters or do you think this is a, di a dialogue that could be had in a dispassionate way? I, I see. I see it as complementary. So when they're arguing about different programming languages, I think they're. I think they're misidentifying what they're doing. They're not designing programming. They're not designing programming languages in the sense of like Python or C or whatever. They're. They're actually designing assembly languages. So this is what was happening in like the early 1950s in computing as well. Like there were various different kinds of hardware with a different kind of uh, instruction sets that one could use, and that's really what's going on with your Kiskits and Penny Lanes and whatever else. They're. They're just thinking about how to interface with particular hardware, or maybe. If if you're like Zapata, you're thinking about how to do some sort of like cross compatibility layer, but it's still at the level of assembly language. What I'm talking about is like the hell with assembly language. Let's start programming in C, right? And it's complementary. C compiles to assembly and assembly, you know, does what it does. And then for me, a high level language should just be like, oh, I'm just going to pass a flag to my compiler to say I want to compile for, um, you know, uh, uh, IonQ's machine or, or, or IBM's machine or whatever. This is irrelevant to me. They, they can have their flame wars. I'm fine with that. I, I don't care. Yeah, I guess the, and I will put the mic down after this question. I guess the only kind of uh, follow on question from that is that, that, that I think there are many, the many ways you could characterize um, programmers and programming in the classical world. But I think the mm -hmm. word that, that, that immediately leaps to mind for me is conservative. There are people who will fight to the death for mm -hmm. a particular paradigm as embedded in a particular language. And I know that you are again talking about a quantum only language, but at some point you've got to get those people on board as well. Yes, so I would point out the, so I, yes, yeah, so the thing that I would pick on is that this, this was a thing that happened in classical computing as well. So you can look at like, uh, so the ones that I tend to pick on are C, Lisp, Fortran, and Algol. Um, so the one that won in some sense was actually Algol. If you look at the like computer science literature for like 25 years, everybody was writing in Algol and then that eventually went away. So um, what I would look for is something like the algol of quantum computing. And just because it survives 25 years and then sort of gets superseded by various other things, like C is in some sense the longer lasting one. But um, the idea is that the difference between these programming paradigms is sort of what are you trying to do with the machine? Lisp was about AI and C was about uh, automating the sorts of things that assembly programmers were doing anyway. And Algol was about expressing algorithms and not worrying about the details of the machine. And Fortran was for, well, I, I have a physics background, so it was for make, to make sure that people like me could program in computers without, you know, uh, worrying our pretty little heads about memory management and whatnot. So, like, there were different use cases for the different languages and there were different target audiences for it. So, um, it's sort of portrayed as like language wars or something like that, but it kind of isn't. It's just different tools for different jobs. What I'm pointing out is just for me as a person who's trying to figure out what can be done with a quantum computer in a practical sense, um, I lack the tooling and I'm just trying to sort of articulate what I want out of the tooling. A lot of my job is in practice designing block encoding strategies. So it seems to me that the language that allows me to design block encoding strategies effectively, as well as leverage the various high level constructs that we tend to use in normal other programming languages, um, and not even programming languages, just, just even basic things like, you know, the concept of data structures like arrays or linked lists or whatever. Um, as long as I've got those to work with, I'm fine. And I, you know, that, that's essentially what I'm looking for, I guess. Thank you. Yeah, cheers. Okay. Uh, yeah, maybe we should wrap up there since we're yeah. already past the hour. So uh, thanks again, you've all for the talk and thanks everybody for sure. joining. Cheers. Okay. Bye-bye. Right.